So I've been using Copilot now for six months and I have ran into some pretty world-class bugs that took quite a bit of time for me to figure out and I figured out ways to use it in the most efficient way possible and I've really enjoyed it. So let me take those six months of learning and just give you a few points on how to use Copilot and use it effectively. And more so, let me kind of address whether or not you should use it because I do think that not everybody should use it. If you're unfamiliar with Copilot, it simply is some sort of AI generation of code. So if I go function, subscribe to the Primogen and I want want to return a boolean it's gonna go through and tell you the truth so go and do it the robot says so so first of all rule number one don't do comment driven development it almost always is a terrible way to use copilot like when i see someone go uh write the quick sort uh quick sort function for me right or however you want to say it it's gonna go over there and it's gonna do a good job you're gonna have to give it a bit of prompting well guess what in the end it's going to produce quicksort. And guess what? That is effectively correct. I can tell right away, but I can also tell a couple other things. When you let Copilot just Jesus take the wheel style, it's going to do things that are both correct and incorrect. Now, I want you to think about quicksort. It's an extremely well-documented, well-understood algorithm. And if you look at this, there's something very, very wrong about it, but it's not logically wrong. It will produce the right answer. What is wrong about it is that A, it creates two arrays here and it creates an array here. It actually programmed Quicksort, but defeated the reason why Quicksort is so fast. Quicksort does not require any memory allocations. That's one of the reasons why it's so amazing. This requires several memory allocations. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, this is an N log N memory calculation going on here. That's not good. So rule one, don't do comment driven development. All right, so rule two will take a moment for me to show you. I've been able to reproduce this bug super reliably and it's come in many different forms. So I'm gonna go like this. Struct, by the way, we're using Rust right now because you know Rust is just the greatest language of all time. There you go. A video frame is a timestamp and audio frame has that. Struct video is going to be, oh, that's still TypeScript. Frames, it's gonna be able to kind of guess what's going on there. It's gonna be able to guess that. All right, so now I want to implement the frames per second calculation for video. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go impl video and I'm going to go pub function FPS take a reference to self return out a float 64 and I'm going to go return um, match uh, self and it's going to go through and it's going to be able to get out some good information right here and boom we have an FPS calculation. There's actually a couple bugs here that have happened. I don't know if you can spot them right away but let me tell you two things that have happened. First off, what is the unit of time for our timestamp? We never specified. Copilot doesn't know. It actually is considering it in seconds. Watch this. If I jump up here and I rename this to type milliseconds, jump back down here, erase this code, and re-let Copilot fill it in, it still didn't even get it right, and it added a syntax error. What happened here? What's wrong with this? Well, to be able to get frames per second, you need to multiply by a 1,000 to convert your milliseconds into a seconds. We're not doing that here. That means if your frame length was 30 and your duration's 1,000, 30 over 1,000, that's not, that should be 30. It's not 30. But second, there's a way more sinister bug going on here does anyone see it really look for it. what could it be well let me tell you what is wrong with this statement the statement says hey i'm going to grab the first video frame and i'm going to grab the last video frame what if the first video frame is the last video frame what is the duration the duration is zero what is going to happen when we divide by zero. Well, I can tell you this much, not a good thing. It's not good to divide by zero in non-JavaScript languages. At least in JavaScript, you get everybody's favorite number, which is not a number. So this leads me to my second point, which is I almost exclusively never let Copilot write my functions. I like to start writing them and I will let Copilot do a bit of completion for me. So if I were to redo this, I would do something like this. Return match self. Let Copilot do that because I'm fine with what I see here. And I don't even look at what Copilot's going to do. I just delete everything inside of there. So I just give the old the DI squirrely brace. Just get that out of there because that is crazy talk. After that, I'm going to add the things that I want. Self uh, frames length put that in there and now copilot gives me a new suggestion guess what 
do you still see it? The bug is still sitting in there. So what I'll do is I'll accept all this, remove the syntax error, remove all of this, and then add a little beautiful piece of logic if n is greater than one. Look at that. Now, this is fantastic. This will actually give me the correct answer. And then, of course, for everything else, just return zero. So now all I have left to do is really look at this. Since it's a very simple piece of code, I should be able to just look at it and see it and know what went wrong. But again, the more code you let Copilot write by itself, the more chances you're going to have an error. Now, luckily, it noticed it was able to catch on to this whole notion right here. Notice that it went from milliseconds to seconds that it did a proper unit conversion and then now is doing the division. But I kind of want to rewind a little bit here. Remember up here when I was doing the audio frame and how the audio frame just like bam, came into existence. Well, once you have a template of logic and you want to really reproduce it, logical boilerplate is incredible. So if I were to take this and go impl audio and I did pub function, it would pretty much be able to guess I want the exact same thing. And it really does a great job of taking what I had up here and spiritually, if you will, moving it into here. And in this case, exactly what I had up there. I find this to be one of the best ways. And the third point, which is define what you want and then use Copilot to do the boilerplate. Here, I can show you another example of that watch. So if I go like type a media, here, we're back in TypeScript to make it easy on everybody. I just wanted to show you that good Rust. That I got to work in Rust somehow, people. So let's say we have an ID, title, description, URL, type, created that, updated that, user ID. Why not? Now let's not do user. Okay, we've done enough. I can now hint to Copilot how to create this boilerplate for me. So I can go like this, create media. By using the name of the type in the function name, it's gonna kinda know what to do, but even more so, if I go like this, ID number, and then tell it what I am returning, it almost exclusively always gets this next thing correct. I don't know why it didn't just get it correct. Come on, media, show me what to do here. Return, yes, oh, come on, Copilot, why you gotta be like that? And let's go, yes, ID, absolutely, yes, title, title, description, description, URL, URL, type, created at, updated at, and user ID. It's really great at creating some of this boilerplate, and you can imagine if you have to do some sort of like object data transform from say a database source into a custom object, if you have these two types defined, Copilot's really great at mapping these things together. And this is just one of those things I find so amazing. So point number four, if you want to use Copilot well, make sure you have your types as explicit as possible because the more explicit your types are, the more Copilot can follow what's going on up in here. But now the real question is, should you use Copilot? And I think this is a great question to ask because it's not a yes or no. I think it largely depends on where you're at in your career. Honestly, if you're a junior, I would just so recommend you don't use Copilot right now. If you can't easily spot bugs, if you haven't been in the workforce for a long time, it's going to be so hard for you to capture all this. And if it's not captured in a good code review, you might find yourself just letting bug in after bug in, and it's going to cause a lot of emotional grief for you. And not only that, but you're going to find yourself watching and code reviewing so much more frequently inside of your IDE that it's just going to make the experience of creating software a lot more awful. Whereas if you are at the tippity top of your game, you're smooth as coconut oil, you're going to get in there and you're going to start writing and it's just going to help you smash out any of that boilerplate so fast. And there's sometimes it's just wonderful. I just Love that part of Copilot. So am I going to continue to use Copilot? I'll probably give it a little bit longer of a chance. And I really am just going to keep on reducing any logic that it produces versus copying ideas or filling in types for me. I just find that the sweet spots, the boilerplate, it's not the logic. The logic is almost either flawed, wrong, or just really, really, really inefficient. I hope you press the like button because this took me six months of just crushing bugs from Copilot to be able to make this video for you. The name is the Primogen.